Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to In the Growth Space. Um, I am really excited about this particular episode. I know I say that about every episode, but not only do we have uh, a returning guest, uh, Mark Miller, um, but we've got a new experiment here on the podcast. And um, we thought we would just really live into the the title of, of the podcast uh, of In the Growth Space. And um, so we've put a, a, a live Zoom audience together, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Mark's new book uh, called Uncommon Greatness. And I've got a copy right here. It's, it's a great book, and I hope you guys uh, go out and get it. Um, but we're also you know, practicing one of the five fundamentals uh, of, of Mark's book. And so we'll talk about that here in, in just a moment. Uh, for those of you in the the, the live Zoom audience uh, that are here with us, welcome. I'm really, really glad that you're here, uh, giving up of your time and and uh, hopefully um, getting some some value as well as as uh, Mark shares with us not only um, it, information from his his new book, but also just his leadership journey. I mean, Mark has had an amazing amazing journey. And like I said before, this is his, his second appearance uh, here in, um, in, in the growth space. Um, and, and so how we're going to do this is I'm gonna, I've got a few questions I want to start off with um, with Mark. And we're going to have a conversation. And then I'm going to open it up to you all for Q&A. So, um, so when, when the time's uh, right, just you know, raise your digital hand. Hopefully you guys know how to do that. There's a little uh, button down on the bottom that, that says um, uh, raise hand. And if you do that, um, you can just raise your hand and we can call on you and then we'll offer the Q, uh, your question to, to Mark. And um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Mark is the former vice president of high performance leadership at Chick-fil-A. And, and he was employee number 16 at the corporate office. I'm sure he'll probably talk a little bit about that and, and, and tell us a little bit about that. And Uncommon Greatness is his 12th book. So he is an incredibly prolific author. And, and I just have to say, first of all, Mark, welcome to the podcast. And before I go any further, welcome. I'm so, so glad you're here, my friend. Well, Thank you. It, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love your writing style. Um, it's, it's so practical. And, and I guess, especially in this particular uh, book, you have a, a chapter on the principles or the fundamentals, and then you have a, a kind of a, what I'll call an application chapter right behind it with some ideas on how mm -hmm. to practice. And, and I really, I really love that. So I guess maybe let's start with like, what, what led you to write this particular book um, on, 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 on leadership and, and really uncommon greatness? Well, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I don't often get invited back a second time, so this is really good. It, it, it must was, have been okay the first it time. It was fun the first time, for sure. <laughs> okay, good. Well, it's great. It's great to be back. Yeah, so for many, many years, uh, my team and I have been trying to write books to meet the emerging needs of leaders. Mm -hmm. we, we always tried to look three to five years out. Now, there were there were a couple of opportunities when we felt like we had to deal with something in the moment. And then there've been a couple when we actually tried to look over the horizon. And really, uh, you know, my favorite Peter Drucker quote is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So we took our, our a swing at that a couple of times, but yeah. typically uh, our sweet spot is trying to anticipate those emerging needs and work on those issues and, and, formulate a point of view that we can share with leaders around the world. Mm. This book is a little bit different. It, it was a need, but let me, let me share a quick backstory. Sure. Um, the first project we worked on 25 years ago was a book that I did with Ken Blanchard called The Secret. Mm -hmm. And in that book, we introduced our picture of leadership. We said it's, it's a lot like an iceberg with about 10% above the waterline and about 90% below. Yeah. The 10% above represents the skills of the leader and the 90% below represents their heart mm. or their character. Yeah. And so Ken and I wrote that first book about the skills. Mm. Chick-fil-A then over several years came back and said, hey, we need a book giving some more clarity and definition to what's below the waterline. And so I wrote The Heart of Leadership. So fast forward almost 20 years, 
Chick-fil-A came to me and they said, we've got a problem. And I said, okay, like, help me, help me understand what, what do you think the problem is? And they said, our point of view on leadership is represented in two books. Mm. And what they discovered is that many leaders had read one book or the other. Okay. Therefore, they had a truncated view of our point of view. And they said, we want you to put this together in one book. Mm. And then they said, and we want it to be a traditional leadership book, not a parable. My okay. first nine books were parables. Yeah. Now, there was a lot of rigor and research and blood, sweat, and tears in figuring out what was true about those various topics. Mm -hmm. But then we wrote it in a, in a business fable. And they said, no, we want a traditional business book Amazing. with case studies and historical illustrations and mm -hmm. stats and so forth and so on. And so this book met, met a little bit of a different kind of need, but uh, I'm excited to have it out there in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I know that, it, I mean, it kind of reminds me of your just previous book that we talked about on the last episode of Culture Rules. And because it, right. it, that was kind of the same kind of a, you know, a format. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I've switched publishers a few years ago and this will, this was my third book in this more traditional format. Mm -hmm. The publisher is, is not against parables, mm -hmm. but he said, you want to serve as many leaders as possible. I said, I do. And he said, there's a market for parables. He said, but you'll serve more leaders if you write a traditional book. Mm -hmm. And so I'm mm -hmm. learning a new skill set. Uh, sure. You know, I had practiced the parables for many years yeah, sure. and now I'm trying to learn to write um, real books. <laughs> or one of my friends, one of my friends says, you're now writing adult books. Adult I said, books. well, don't talk bad about my parables. <laughs> yeah. We've got about a million and a half copies of those parables in 25 languages. So yeah. they are serving leading. They are. But uh, so, <laughs> so this is a new skill set for me and I'm, uh, I'm trying to find my footing. Uh, that's great. Well, I think you found it, my friend. It's, it's really, uh, it's really a great book. Um, it sure is. And uh, let me mention one more thing. Yeah, now, yeah, you mentioned please. it in your introduction. One thing I love about this new format uh, anybody who's read my parables or others, you'll notice there's something missing. There aren't many tactics in a parable. Mm. My publisher on an early draft years ago made me take out about 75% of the, the tactics. Okay. He said, you put too many tactics in a parable and you kill the story. Ah, and so when I switched to this more traditional format, my new publisher said, you can put in all the tactics you want. Oh, good. So yeah. I think uh, now on my third attempt, probably at least 50% of the word count, maybe 75% of the word count are tactics because that's what leaders have been asking me for 45 years. How do you do this? How do you do You can say cast vision or you can say engage and develop people. How do you do this? And so that is the one thing I've, I've really um, loved about the more traditional uh, book yeah. is I can say, Hey, here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. Well, and it's really helpful. And it, and, and I, I, I really love the practical application Let's let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals. So, you know, what are some of the the, the fundamentals that you discovered in, in the research that you did and and really just mm -hmm. um, how you how you presented them in in Uncommon Greatness? Yeah. So just another quick word of context. We we discovered these fundamentals really 25 years ago through qualitative research. We worked a couple of years, but we we didn't do any quant work. We did interviews, benchmarking, you know, best practice studies. Uh, we read a couple hundred books on leadership. So a very rigorous qualitative process back in the day. Yeah. So when we had a chance to, to do this new book, we said, let's go back and do the quant work. One, we need to validate what we've been talking about for 25 years. We were confident that we would, mm -hmm. but we know there are a lot of people that would prefer to, to look at the data. Mm -hmm. And who knows what we might learn if if we actually uh, apply some more, a different form of rigor. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up interviewing or surveying over 4,000 leaders oh, wow. from six countries. Wow. And uh, and so we did validate that, that we, we got it right 25 years ago. And so uh, we're gonna we're gonna stay on the same same song that we've been singing for many many years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, give you an example. Uh, the first fundamental is see the future. Right. Leadership always begins with a picture of future of the future. Yeah. It's when the leader takes what they know to be true and what they know must be true, mm -hmm. and and they weave those threads together into a compelling picture of the future. 
that they can rally others to join them in the pursuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the first fundamental. And, you know, a lot of leaders are really good at that. And a lot of leaders struggle. Yeah. And so we're trying to help, help leaders get better at that uh, foundational fundamental. People ask me yeah. if it's the most important one. I said, well, it, it's first among equals. Yeah. Sure. Because if you're not trying to accomplish something or achieve something or become something, then you actually don't need leadership. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's interesting. I, I have a question for you about um, vision because I, I work with a lot of emerging leaders. And, and one of the things mm -hmm. that I find is that this is difficult for them because more times than not, they are or, or have been um, doers and, and kind of in the weeds of, of, of actually the tactics of, of executing a vision, mm -hmm. but then coming up and, and kind of, uh, you know, kind of coming up for air, so to speak, and looking out, it's, it's, it's a new skill for them. And so I'm kind of curious, how do, how do leaders like that learn the skill of, of creating a vision? Well, I think uh, this is probably a great place for my standard disclaimer. I would encourage you and your listeners not to misinterpret the brevity of my response with the magnitude of that question. Okay. We could talk, we could talk a long time, but let me see if I can and add some value. I think one of the things that many leaders stumble uh, when they think about vision, because they tend to think about the vision that a CEO sets or that a geopolitical or national leader sets, and, and, and that is a form. But we say that we wanted to articulate fundamentals that are true at every level. I mean, I do know of organizations, organizations I respect that have fundamentally different competency models for leaders at different levels. Okay. That was too complicated for us. We're simple people. We sell chicken. And we said, no, what, what could we say that's true for the 15 year old shift leader and true for the CEO mm -hmm. and see the future is an example of that. What you change is your time horizon. Uh, A shift leader is thinking about vision for this shift. Yeah. And what do I want to, what do I want to be true in four hours? It's not true now. Mm -hmm. How do I want this shift to play out? How do I want to add value? How do I want our team uh, to add value to our guests? And then as you move up in an organization, you elongate your time horizon. Mm -hmm. Now, just to touch on something you said there about pulling up, that is an ever present tension for leaders at every level. Yeah. And I, what I would argue is the higher you go in an organization, the, the longer your timeline, mm -hmm. the more time you're going to need to pull up because it's harder to see the future a decade out yeah. than it is to see the future of a shift. Mm -hmm. But leaders at every level have to manage this heads up and heads down tension yeah. because they have to care about today. Mm -hmm. Even the CEO has to care about today, yeah. but they've got to invest enough time in the future to ensure that they have one. Because if you don't write the script for your future, your competitors will, yeah. and you won't like the way it turns out. Yeah, boy, isn't that the truth? I, I'm, I'm so glad that you talked about that tension because I, and, and I, and you're right. It's at, it's at every level of, of, of leadership from the CEO to, you know, the, 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 the customer service person. And so, um, you know, that having that engaging in that tension is, um, really, I think something that every leader has to do. Um, so seeing the future is, is that first fundamental. The second fundamental is engaging and developing others. This again, I think is something that is a mindset shift for a lot of emerging leaders in particular to, you know, think about how do I invest in others? So, so talk a little bit about th this particular fundamental, Mark. Well, we would argue that engagement has at least two facets. The first is who do you recruit? Who do you select? Who mm. do you invite to join your team or your organization? Yeah. Who who you're, who are you engaging to do the work with you? Yeah. And we think that is really, really, really important. Uh, I referenced Peter Drucker earlier. I'm, yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. And uh, I like to share something that he said that I've actually never seen published but he said it at a live event hmm. and someone asked him, what is the most important decision a leader makes? Mm. Which I thought was a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, who does what? Hmm. Hmm. And so I believe Drucker, 
I think it's the most important decision a leader makes. And so I do not want to undermine this first facet uh, of engagement. you got to decide who's going to be on the team. And I think that matters a lot. And once men and women are in your organization, you got to figure out which role they're best suited for. So sure. that's huge. Yeah. But the second facet of engagement is when you and I as leaders create the context and the environment mm -hmm. such that people willingly invest themselves fully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like engagement matters. Yeah. And you, you know, and your listeners know there's a lot out there on engagement. We tried to simplify that. We spent our lives trying to simplify this stuff without becoming simplistic, right? We all know there's a point when, when you lose all credibility it, and and what was true is no longer true. So we're trying to push as far as we can, as simple as possible and no further. And we said engagement is really about how much someone cares, uh, yeah. how much they care about their work, mm -hmm. how much they care about their coworkers, yeah. how much they care about the customer and how much they care about the organization. And leaders determine how much somebody cares. Mm -hmm. You say, well, is that my responsibility? Well, sure. Ultimately it is mm -hmm. because if you can't create the environment and context for someone to care, then they don't need to work for you. Right. They don't need to be on your team because you need people who care. Yeah. And so, so it's, it's getting the right people and then creating the right context and environment. Mm -hmm. And we think engagement is, is essential for high performance. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Mark, because yeah, I mean, I, so many, so many surveys and 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 information that's the the data that's out there right now is that engagement is such an important um, aspect of 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 performance and um, yeah, so, yeah, totally. Well, totally and great. it's awful, by the way. Your your audience probably knows yeah. that the two predominant metrics that are published annually are Gallup and ADP. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Buckingham, who used to work at Gallup, now works at ADP. So they have a, a metric. Uh, last year's numbers globally from ADP were only 15% of the global workforce is engaged at work. And there are always people who are quick to point to the sorry state of the workforce. <laughs> And I say, no, that number is not an indictment on the workforce. That number is an indictment on leadership. Leadership. Oh, that's 100%. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. Hadn't really thought so of it that it's way. A, it's a huge deal. It's yeah. a big deal. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Well, um, so so seeing the future, engaging and developing others, uh, those are the first two fundamentals. And then, of course, reinventing continuously. And, 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 and I love this particular um, uh, fundamental as well, because I think that if we don't reinvent and if we don't continually try new things, we're, we're going to fall behind and we're going to lose the competitive advantage that we may or may, may have had. And so talk a little sure. bit about, you know, why this is yeah. so important. Well, I'll say two things. First, I want to applaud you for reinventing today and, <laughs> and trying something and let, okay. let's see if this works. Yeah, so thank right. you for, for <laughs> modeling that. Uh, it, it is so important. Here's, here's the, the challenge I think I'm, I'm trying to overcome or help leaders overcome. I meet far too many leaders who believe change is a burden mm. or it's an obstacle or it's a nuisance or it's an inconvenience or it's something to be avoided at all costs. I would say they don't understand their job. Yeah. We are supposed to create change, positive, mm. sustainable change in service of a vision mm. or a mission. Mm. I mean, we're, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you always got or less, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, the half-life of ideas is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. And you mentioned using losing relevance and competitive advantage. It can actually be worse than that. Uh, Arnold Toynbee did a study where he looked at the rise and fall of 21 civilizations, which mm -hmm. I can't even get my head around no, that. I can't. And there have been... There have been authors since that have mapped what he discovered with corporate rise and fall, and, and they track completely. And the reason I mention that is one of the signals that an organization oh, and a civilization are on the precipice of, of demise is when leaders apply yesterday's answers to today's questions. Oh, that's so good. So that's I mean, reinvention is not... Uh, 
an option. It's not yeah. extracurricular right. for those leaders and organizations that are that are going to survive and thrive, thrive into the future. So it's yeah. huge. I love that, man. This is some. These are some things that I think not only don't get talked about enough, or if at all, but I think they're so critical to those business leaders who really want to um, not not only just survive, but truly thrive in the new era of, of, of business and the, the, where we are today in, in the world. And I um, really appreciate you, you know, bringing that forward in this particular fundamental. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of go through our, our last two fundamentals and then I'm going to open it up to our, our Zoom audience to ask some questions of you. Um, but the next fundamental is honestly, I, I think it's my favorite and I, I, I know that they're, they're, they're all equal, but, but the tension between valuing relationships and valuing results, I think that's a, that's a tension that many yeah. leaders have a real struggle with. And, and I, I mean, I'll raise my hand because I, I have that, that struggle, but I, I, I know it's important. Okay, so just a quick word of affirmation. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, we've been teaching this content globally for 25 years. Yeah. Um, hundreds of thousands of leaders, m maybe millions of leaders. And this is the most difficult of the five mm. for virtually every leader. Mm. I do think there's about 5% that don't struggle with this. And mm. I always say, I don't like you. If you're <laughs> right. one of those 5%, I don't I like don't you. Like, yeah, exactly. Now, and there's a reason, there's a reason this tension exists mm. is that most leaders have a natural bias. Mm. We either are more results oriented or we're more relationship oriented. Yeah. And so that, that means that tension is, is in us and we have to acknowledge that. But the truth remains, the best leaders value both. Mm. So what I've been telling leaders for a long, long time is I'm not suggesting we change you, but you've got to find a way to value both. Your bias will remain, I believe, the rest of your life. Sure. But if you want, if you want to maximize performance, which most leaders do, yeah. the only path is to value both. Mm. Because if you focus exclusively on results, you will undermine results over time. Mm. And if you focus on results exclusively, you clearly will not optimize or maximize your results. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick trick on this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a two-step process. I know I need to move through this quickly. No, you're but good. You're good. So many leaders struggle with this. Um, here's what you do. You acknowledge your bias. Mm -hmm. You quit trying to hide from it. You quit trying to run. You quit yeah. trying to deny it. You quit trying. No. You just say, I am more results oriented or I am more relationship oriented. You start there. Yeah. And then step two, it's only a two-step process. You compensate. Mm. So I see several folks on this call are wearing yeah. glasses. Yep. Here, And I wear contacts. Here's what I would suggest. You are not a lesser leader because you wear glasses. Yeah. I'd say you're pretty smart because you found something that you didn't do naturally well and you compensate. All you had to do is figure out the right uh, level of the prescription, right? Mm -hmm. How much assistance do you need? And so once you own your bias, you then putting mechanisms and systems and people in place to help you compensate. I'll give you just <clears throat> one example. Again, we could talk a long time about this. Um, if you're more results oriented as I am, you, you need to, as a minimum, be sure that you have somebody in your inner circle, preferably on your leadership team, if you have a leadership team, mm -hmm. that is more relationship oriented. Oh, yeah. And that might be all the compensation you need, because when you say X, Y, Z, they'll say, don't forget about the people. <laughs> How's this going to play with the people? And right. that might be all you need to bring you back to, yeah, yeah, we got to think about that too. But you may need to do more. And of course, if you're more relationship oriented, you need to be sure you've got one of those, at least one of those results uh, biased people mm. on your team. And so uh, I think it's a lifelong journey, um, mm. you know, of, of compensating yeah. for your bias, but it, it will work if you'll, if you'll remain disciplined because you'll maximize uh, the performance of your team and your organization if you learn to, to value both. Yeah, I love I love uh, what you said there, Mark, about you know having somebody to help compensate and help just remind you. I mean, I think that's the value of having an inner circle and having you know mm -hmm. a, a team that will help 
balance, you know, balance this all out, especially where I may be strong, you know, somebody else can help me in my weakness or, or, or where I'm not strong. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I I really like that. So, and let me quickly say, you may decide that's not enough. I mean, that's the first click, you know, when they say, is this better or this better to the eye doctor and they're showing you the different stuff (laughs) that may be all you need to do, but you may need to do more and you just got to keep compensating until you value both. Mm. that's the magic that's the sweet spot that's when your vision is back to 2020 i love that i love that analogy that's so good well so the the fifth uh, fundamental is embodying a leader's heart and and this is probably my close second um uh, i I, because i love um the this particular fundamental why why did this one make the list well this one is again there are those that would argue this is the most important one. Because if you go back to that picture I described of the iceberg, yeah. 90% of your efficacy and your success and your impact and your influence is determined by this fifth fundamental. Now, I actually said that on a podcast recently, uh-huh. which is a little bit metaphorical because yeah. that's how icebergs are divided. And my host said, no, you're, you're not right on that 90%. I said, well, tell me more. And he said, we actually did the research and 77% of a leader's efficacy is determined by their heart. I said, okay, <laughs> okay. so I probably should, into, intellectual integrity <laughs> demands that I, I'm going to start saying 77%, 77% of your success. Love so that. this one is this one is so significant. And and all I think we've got time for is yeah. me to explain why yeah. it's so important. And I think I think your listeners will probably just say, oh, that makes perfect sense. Sure. If your heart is not right, no one cares about your skills. Yeah, so true. You probably, all of our your listeners, they probably can think of some leader who has the skill set, mm-hmm. but they don't want to follow them. Mm-hmm. Well, if they've got the skill set, why don't you want to follow them? <laughs> it's because you don't trust their heart. Right. You don't right. trust their motives. Yeah. You think they're self-serving, mm-hmm. that yeah. they don't they don't care about you. They don't care about the organization. Right. They put themselves first. They take, they take credit for your work. Any number of signals, uh, they, they are egotistical. By the way, the number one barrier that we discovered globally to more effective leadership, mm. according to leaders, we ask every leader to rate their leader. Mm-hmm. If you're frontline, you're rating your manager. If you're manager, you're rating your director. If you're a director, so forth, all the way up to rating the CEO if you're a senior leader. The number one impediment to increased effectiveness is, le- is ego, according to leaders, mm. ego. So if people think you're egotistical, that's a heart issue. I mean, you yeah. can just make a long list of heart issues. Sure. Uh, if you're selfish as opposed to generous and so forth and so on. And so um, this is this is the one that, sticking with the analogy back in the day, what used to sink the ships, they didn't hit the top of the iceberg. They hit what was under the water because you can see what's above the waterline and you can avoid it. Right. But you couldn't see what was below the waterline. Yeah. yeah. And so... We, we just think you, you really do need to guard your heart. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I love that. I love that. So, well, Mark, I, I could go, I, I personally could go on asking you a lot of questions for, a, because I'm so curious about this and, and leadership is my thing. And, and, and the, the, the book is, is so good. And so I hope our listeners will go out and, and get this book. And I know there's a, just a myriad of, of books on leadership but um, this one is really, really good. It's 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 not super long, but it really gives you the tactics to be able to help, just like we've been talking about today. So, um, first of all, thank you for writing it. I, I think it's it's just fantastic, Mark. Um, and and I would like to be able to to have um, our guests um, ask you some questions now here too. So. Again, this is kind of new for us, so but I thank you, uh, Dr. Cynthia and Jose. You've got your hands raised, right on. Um, so let's go, Jose. You you were first. Why don't you uh, go ahead and um, Wendy, if you would uh, put him, if you could spotlight him on the on the stage, that would be great. Hey. Oh gosh, I'm on the spotlight. Yes, now. you are. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, Jose. Hello, Jose. Hey, Mark. Yeah, very good to meet you, Mark. I've been following you since the heart of a leader, and I love that parable. I just love it. Actually, I typically recommend that book. Uh, I tell uh, I'm on, on, on leadership training as well. Uh, thank you, David, for inviting me, by the way. My thank pleasure. you again. Yes. Uh, but I always say, you know, this is a very easy to comprehend. 
very easy to understand. Go and, and, and just practice the heart of a leadership. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. My pleasure. Um, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so I had a question about my pleasure because I cannot stop saying my pleasure, but let's leave it for another another phase. <laughs> I, I have one question, Mark. Um, when I am uh, teaching, mentoring, coaching uh, leaders, um, I, I make this reference and, and I want you to fix me if my assessment is not uh, accurate. Um, I, I ask, um, I typically see leaders saying, I want to keep you accountable to what I am giving you these tasks. Mm -hmm. And I say, you can keep them responsible because you are providing that task, that challenge. You can keep them accountable if they, if it comes from them to you, mm -hmm. you can ask them, okay, this is the overall task. And, and my, my manager, I am being the leader, the president, and I asked my director or my manager, so what can I keep you accountable? And, and that is a difference. So let me rephrase my question. Can you tell us the difference between responsibility and accountability from that perspective? Is, if that is an, a, a good uh, question to ask? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, one that I don't know that I have thought about previously. Let me, let me say a quick word about accountability. I have long been an advocate. I think accountability needs to be rebranded. Uh, we actually have been trying to uh, to do that just a little bit, and we, we call it the gift of accountability. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that most humans, at least the ones I hang out with, they want to be successful. And accountability is one of those things that helps people be accountable. I am... I, 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 I do better work when I'm accountable. Give me a deadline. Let's have an action item with when's it going to be done. Mm. And my batting average is probably close to 100% because I won't accept something I can't do because that's, by the way, another way to build trust as a leader is you do what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. That's the way to build trust on a team. But we, we have been trying to say, let's help people be successful and accountability is, is a gift that we can provide for them. And one more quick, kind of a little bit uh, strange uh, analogy. Somebody asked me one day, they said, what's the most important part of a kite? And I thought, <laughs> well, my goodness, a kite doesn't have many parts. And so I said, the tail. And they said, no. And I said, the, the sail. I didn't even know what to call it. They said, no. I said, the little sticks. <laughs> And they said, no. And I said, there are no more parts. And they said, no, 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 no. The most important part of a kite is the string. <laughs> it's the accountability being tethered to the earth that creates the tension that allows the kite to fly. Mm -hmm. You have a kite up in the air, you cut the string, it's going to crash. Mm -hmm. Without accountability, we're all going to crash, right? We need that from each other. So I'm not sure that I can um, differentiate those terms, I guess, my my first response is most people, at least the people we want to surround ourselves with, typically want more responsibility. And so I think that does not have the negative connotation for many that accountability does. I think they're both positive concepts. Mm -hmm. I want to earn the, the right for you to give me more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, I also want you to hold me accountable and I want others to hold me accountable. That's one of the hallmarks of a great team is they hold each other accountable. Yeah. I don't know how much you know about professional sports, but the coaches don't police the locker room. Yeah. The players do. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the marks of maturity of a team is, is they hold each other accountable. So I, you could probably differentiate the terms. I think they're both really good things. And I would advocate both mm -hmm. give people real responsibility and provide them with the gift of accountability. Yeah. Love that. Thank you, Mark. Love that. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Dave. Great, great question, Jose. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. That's, that's awesome. Um, Dr. Cynthia, um, let's uh, bring you up onto uh, the digital stage and uh, it's great to have you here. Let's see here. See if we can bring you up onto the stage to spotlight you. Hi, Cynthia. There we go. Yeah, there you Hello are. Hello there. Thank you so much, Mark. 
Uh, so I'm not a leader trainer. I am a leader. I'm a, a psychologist, CEO of a nonprofit community mental health center uh, up in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, so Fantastic. first, yeah, let me thank you uh, for your work. Um, I've often found a lot of leadership books I read are very results heavy and don't really apply to nonprofits. Um, so I'm I'm always grateful when somebody writes in a way that includes that heart, not just results and profit. So appreciate that. But what I find challenging in the nonprofit space is sometimes that vision and even the ability to reinvent continuously mm -hmm. is challenged by either the board or, mm. you know, in my case, being um, like the state with DHHS is one of our biggest funders. And so I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about how do I, as a nonprofit leader, like rise above the system that's asking me not to do the very things that I know I need to do to lead well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just such a conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I'd love your, your thoughts about kind of applying that for um, either a nonprofit leader or even a leader lower in the ranks who's maybe CEO is not acting in those ways. Yeah. Wow. What a fantastic question. Um, awesome. Well, I've worked with nonprofits a lot over the last 45 years. My son actually is the CEO of a global nonprofit as well. So I kind of, I feel, I feel what you're, what you're talking about. Um, I think we all have to work within the boundaries that have been provided uh, it's, it's, it's just part of our reality. And I think we have to push. I think we have to try and change the boundaries when necessary and appropriate, challenge them as necessary and appropriate. But I, I historically, let me, I have struggled with this a little bit, even in the corporate world, um, uh, cause I didn't like the boundaries and, and, <laughs> So that's just a little bit about me. Maybe you're a psychologist. You can help me figure all this out later. Um, but there it again, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to you, but this was a revelation for me there. there I believe there's something more important than being right. And it's submission to authority. Mm. And, and it took me years and years and years oh, to kind of come to grips with that. If somebody is asking me to do something and it's not immoral, illegal, or unethical, and I am under their authority, then my only legitimate choice is to honor them in the process. Hmm. That doesn't mean we don't push. That doesn't mean we don't challenge. I would just ask you and your team to think about, okay, how can we have maximum impact within boundaries that we do not control? Because if, if, if we end up focusing too much on what we can't do, we won't focus on what we can do. Hmm. I had a leader not a while back. He said, there are just so many things I can't do. I said, well, have you made a list of what you can do? Mm. And he said, well, never thought about it that way. <laughs> so, so I think there is a lot you can do. Now, there may be some reinvention that you've never considered because you're thinking about the boundary. Like, okay, the boundary may be the catalyst for your reinvention. So, so here's a crazy random example. All of the Chick-fil-A operators uh, are they're independent contractors, but they're not corporate employees. And so our legal team has said, hey, they're independent business people. We can't teach them leadership. Well, friends, despite my best efforts to have uh, redundancy in our uh, recording, we had a technology issue both with our Zoom recording and our other tool, our other podcast uh, recording device. And so we lost the last few minutes of, of this particular episode with Mark Miller. And, you know, his, his answer that he was giving here to Dr. Cynthia was really, really good because he was talking about our constraints and that we all have constraints in leadership. He was giving some, um, uh, some examples from his uh, experience with Chick-fil-A. And um, what he was telling Dr. Cynthia was that we can all find uh, other solutions within the boundaries, within the constraints that we're all given. And sometimes those constraints can really help us find a very creative solution. So 
it was really, really good. And I really wished uh, that we could have uh, brought that component and that part of the conversation to you as well. You know, we tried this new format, which I thought worked really well. Um, and uh, it, it honestly got me outside of my own comfort zone. And there were some things that I learned in this format. And one of the things that I learned is that um, having a team is critical if you're going to create a experience like this and, and having a format like this. So what did I learn? So I learned from this format that having a team uh, is, is critical. Having other people who can help you with the technology of Zoom, of, Zoom, of, br of bringing people up onto the, the digital stage is so critical. And this is a huge, huge shout out to Wendy Schlensky, who helped support me um, on this particular podcast episode. Um, and, and on short notice, too, um, I have to say, too, that uh, Wendy and I are part of the exchange community. Um, and I just want to say thank you to uh, not, not only Wendy, but also uh, Dr. Cynthia, who uh, is also part of that, that, uh, that, that community. Uh, just appreciate the, the love and the support that uh, the exchange community uh, has given to me. And in this particular case, Wendy uh, gave to me um, for, for this particular pod podcast episode. Um, the other thing I learned really is that this kind of a format helps us to, um, to, to learn and to grow because of other people's questions. And so just because other people have a question doesn't mean that we can disengage and, and, and zoom out. But we can actually all zoom in and, and actually learn and unlock the potential that's within uh, any kind of a group. Anytime a group gets together, um, the potential, the learning, the growth that lies within a group of people can all be unlocked by the power of choreographed conversations. And I, I just I really loved this format. And I honestly am so grateful to Mark Miller for giving us his time um, his leadership experience and vulnerability, but also his willingness to um, try something like this as well. I, I know that I sprung this on his his PR uh, person, and um, she was willing to take it to him, and he agreed to, to to have this kind of a format. So thank you, Mark. I really, really appreciated. So one other thing that didn't get recorded because of the technology issue was um, Mark sharing his cell number with everyone, not only on the call, but obviously with you listening as well. And so his number, I want to share it here. It's 678-612-8441. That number again is 678-612-8441. And his email address is mark at leadeveryday.com. Mark at leadeveryday.com. We'll make sure that those are in the, the show notes as well. But uh, I hope that uh, that's been helpful for you. Thank you so much for being here in this particular podcast episode and, and really sharing um, this new book, uh, Uncommon Greatness, with, um, with Mark Miller and our, our studio audience. And so thank you to all of you who were able to be here uh, today live. And until next time, be well, my friends.